whether that is Donald Trump or whether it's Judge Moore, with good people going door to door and knocking on the door and telling people with passion, this is who you ought to vote for. You know who taught us that lesson? Barack Obama. You may not like Barack Obama's policies. You may not like him as a president, but let me tell you, as a politician, he knew exactly what he was doing. Rudy Giuliani, a good friend of mine, a man I really respect, stood on that stage in 2008 to mock and ridicule him in front of the Republican convention. Had that great line, what's a community organizer? I'll tell you what it is, somebody could kick your ass. <laughs> Twice. But the grassroots of the Tea Party and the evangelical Christians and the conservative Catholics learned that lesson. You too can go door to door. You too can ring doorbells. And folks understand when you come to the door and your lived experience, they respect you. So when you talk about a Donald Trump or you talk about a Judge Moore, it means something. In Alabama, you folks were able to turn the tables. You made, you took Mitch McConnell's money and you took it from his biggest asset to his biggest liability. The more money they spend, the fewer votes they get. Yeah. Now, Mitch, I, I don't know if you're watching today. I don't know if you're watching Value Voters or you maybe have your staff. But if I can, uh, if I can take a little rift on Plutarch and Shakespeare... Up on Capitol Hill, because I've been getting calls, it's like, it's like before the Ides of March, right? The only question is, and this is just an analogy or metaphor, whatever you want to call it, they're just looking to find out who's going to be Brutus to your Julius Caesar. Yeah, Mitch, the donors, the donors are not happy. They've all left you. We've cut your oxygen off, Mitch, Okay. The money, money's not courageous, but money is smart, okay? And right now, money's sitting there saying, hey, I see these folks. They're worked up. They're mad, and they're mad for a reason. Here's one of the reasons they're mad. And by the way, Southern Poverty Law Center, can you do me, do me a favor? You talk about hate and everything like that. Why don't you go talk to your corporatist clients and give you all the money to run these folks down and ask them about the economic hate crimes they've been pulling on the working men and women of the United States of America? Why don't you answer for them? Why don't you answer for all the foundations, all the foundations of all these guys that put that money in, and let's look at their economic crimes. They've gutted this country, and you've taken their money, and you call these good people hate crime perpetuators because they try to put forward the best values of a civilization that's been around for thousands of years. That's a hate crime. We're in the Valley of Decision. This is the fourth great turning in American history. We've had the Revolution. We've had the Civil War. We've had the Great Depression and World War II. This is the fourth. And we're going to be one thing. It's going to take 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years to go through this. And we're going to be one thing or the other on the other side of it. We're either going to be the country that was bequeathed to previous generations and to you, or we're going to be something else. And in that valley of decision, it's not about Mark Meadows and Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and Mike Lee, and all the, all the great leaders of the conservative movement, Vice President Pence, Laura Ingram, Steve Bannon, Seb Gorka. The burden's on you. The burden's on your shoulders. On the morning of November 8th, right, I knew as I told the president the entire time since so I stepped in there in August when he was, you know, 16 points down, double digits in every battleground state, 70 on the generic ballot, got to be at 90, no money, not a lot of organization. I said, we can pull this thing together. You're going to win 100% metaphysical certitude you're going to win. 
on Billy Bush Saturday. Everybody's running for the exits. Everybody's jumping ship. Nobody's making justifications for what the president said, including the president of the United States, or at that time, candidate Trump himself. But I told him, 100% metaphysical certitude, you're going to win. Because folks are looking for change in this country. They're looking to take their country back, and you're the vehicle and instrument that's going to do it. And they don't care about locker room talk. Because we're going to bring to that debate the women that William Jefferson Clinton attacked and his wife covered for him. And we're going to let the American people decide between your words and his actions. That's why I'm a street fighter. I'm all about winning. You know why? Because we have to win. This next 15, 20 years, and I would love to tell you, we could wave a, ma wave a magic wand, I'd love to tell you that President Trump, as good as man as he is, that he could snap his fingers and it would all be better. But it's not. Every day is going to be a grind. Every day is going to test you. But here's the good news. I know you wouldn't have it any other way. Let's go back to Alabama for a second. You know, since uh, the Associated Press called Judge Moore at, uh, I think, 9 o'clock at night in, in Montgomery, Montgomery Town, rough around there, he, he had won by, what, 10 points, roughly 10 points over Big Luther. <laughs> Early in the day, there had been a bigger, bigger victory. Bob Corker. Bob Corker. You know, a real piece of work. He had called the president. This guy had, what, $6 million of cash in, in the bank, or thereabouts. Had uh, uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, most prestigious on Capitol Hill, and the one you can raise most money on besides the banking committee. In a state that, what, President Trump won by 22 points, some, some outrageous number. He didn't have an opponent. There's no opponent. And according to him, now President Trump disagrees with this, according to him, President Trump said he'd endorse him. Money, prestige, no opponent, an endorsement of the President of the United States. And he quit. Because he just saw, he had called over and talked about the exit polls, right? What was happening down in Alabama. And he knew the good men and women in Alabama were holding Mitch McConnell accountable down there. And they were going to hold Bob Corker accountable too. That's right. That's right. Now, now, they've said in this, this civil war inside the, the Republican Party that, um, you know, why are you, going, why are you going after folks? Why are you going after folks like Barrasso and Deb Fisher and, and Heller and all these guys that, that, that vote the right way? You know, as Bob Corker has trashed the commander-in-chief of our armed forces, while we have young men and women in harm's way, right? Well, he said he's leading them on a path to World War III, that he is not stable, that people have to keep him moderated, that it's an adult, it's a, what, an adult center, and they took the morning shift off, Why some U.S. senator in a position of that authority for the first time in the history of our republic, has mocked and ridiculed a commander-in-chief when we have kids in the field? Have I seen Barrasso come to a stick and condemn that? Have I seen Deb Fisher come to a stick and condemn that? Have I seen Heller come to a stick and condemn that? You have not. And let me give a warning to you. Nobody can run and hide on this one. These folks are coming for you. The day of taking a few nice conservative votes and hiding is over. These folks are not rubes. These folks are not morons. These folks are not idiots. Okay? You know, I'm a graduate. I'm a, actually an honors graduate of the Harvard Business School, and I worked at Goldman Sachs. And if you ask me if I would rather be governed by the first hundred people that walked into this conference today 
or the top 100 partners at Goldman Sachs, I would take the first 100 people every day of the week. Because the common sense, decency, intelligence, grit, and determination would ensure that our country is safe and prosperous, and so would the world. And let's look at these elites. And the reason we position you know, Hillary Clinton as the guardian or the tribune of a corrupt and incompetent elite. Look what these geniuses have left for, for President Trump where they said, oh, this guy's unfit. This guy's unfit to be commander-in-chief. No, he's unfit to do this, unfit to do that. Look what they've foisted upon President Trump in the first couple of months of his administration. You got the Bay of Pigs down in Venezuela. You have the Cuban Missile Crisis in Korea. You got Vietnam and Afghanistan. That's not his doing. This is what all these geniuses have been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. This is the same crowd that said, hey, if we just let China have most favored nations and let them in the WTO, they're going to be, as they get wealthier, they're going to be a liberal democracy and a free market capitalism. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that played out well. China's been a, a Confucian mercantilist society for 4,000 years. They know what they're doing, and they're not changing. They're running the tables on us right now. They're at full economic war with us right now. Don't ask me. Look at The Economist. Read J.D. Uh, Vance's Hillbilly Elegies, the, the cultural undertones of the Trump revolt. Read the studies coming out of MIT and Harvard that says there's a direct correlation between the factories and jobs that leave for China and the opioid crisis. This populist, nationalist, conservative revolt that's going on, that drove Donald Trump to victory, that drove Judge Moore to victory, that will drive 15 candidates to victory in 2018. And well, and I hate to break the news to Graydon Carter and the folks, good folks at Vanity Fair, but yes, President Trump's not only gonna finish this term, he's gonna win with 400 electoral votes in 2020. Now, why is this a populist revolt? It's real simple. You guys have more common sense, more understanding of what we need to do, and more decency than the elites. And, 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 and the first order of business is to, is to undo all the damage of globalism, right? That allowed Silicon Valley and Wall Street and Hollywood and the imperial capital right here in Washington, D.C., and London, and Beijing, and Davos, right? The party of Davos. It's undo globalism. The reason we need populism and we need to get it formed up is that there's bigger and more crucial decisions coming down the road in the next 10 or 20 years. The convergence of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, the computer chip. There are going to be decisions in front of mankind in the next 20 years that man's never had to face before. And if you think that the elites that got the world into the situation it is today are going to make the right judgments 20 years from now, you're sadly mistaken. It's folks like you that have to tell folks this is not a science experiment. This is not an engineering exercise. You're free men and women in the greatest republic in the history of Earth. And, and why, why are we nationalist? It's not ethno-nationalism. These guys can run that drill all they want. It's economic nationalism. It doesn't matter what your race is, your ethnicity, your gender, your religion, your sexual preference. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. As long as you're a citizen of this republic, that's what matters. Yeah. Economic nationalism is what binds us together. Economic nationalism and understanding, we're going to bring those jobs back. It's not the second law of thermodynamics why they left. There's no inexorable law that took those jobs to Asia. 
and those factories to Asia and left us with gutted communities of opioid addicts. That was human agency. That was decisions of men and women that did that. And it's decisions of men and women that are going to bring those factories back and bring those jobs back. The, the, the smart folks in the Democratic Party, and trust me, a lot of smart, smart folks are there. They understand that. They had that conference six weeks ago, no identity politics, because they know identity politics is a loser. I knew it was a loser. When we took the campaign over, remember, Trump was 16 points down. They said, oh, my God, he's gonna, he knows he's going to lose by 25 or 30 points. So he brought in the mad bomber, and he's going to just destroy his enemies on the way down, right? And what you saw was a highly disciplined campaign run up on these themes of populism and economic nationalism, right? The rule of law. And Hillary, you know, Hillary came out. She, she was on the beach raising money because, you know, they, they were running a four corners offense. She came out. She, 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 she came out after about a week. And she had that thing. I'm sitting in the war room. We had all these TV sets and all the young men and women there that worked on the rapid response before. She hadn't given a speech in a month. She came out. It was Breitbart, alt-right, ethno They weren't there to debate Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton just did a 900-page book or whatever. She's going around the country. She still can't tell anybody why she should be president of the United States. <laughs> she, she can whine about, you know, all the, all the bad things that she thinks happened to her, but she can't make a convincing case of why she should be president. She can't take on any Donald Trump's ideas, didn't want to do that. They wanted to use that $2 billion just to destroy him. But on the morning of the 9th, I think we won at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was called 3 o'clock in the morning. That coalition with Reince Priebus and the RNC, um, you know, we won. As I always knew we would. But the key that picked the lock in North Carolina, in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Iowa, in Michigan, in Wisconsin was you. Ask Tony Perkins. He's got the numbers. He'll walk you through. The turnout of evangelical Christians and conservative Catholics in those key districts, that is the difference in victory. I was most nervous about North Carolina. It was not the weekend before, but the weekend before that, that I was down in North Carolina with the president, Mark Meadows. And Mark Meadows came up to me and said, we got this. He said, we got this. I said, Mark, I don't know. It's, it's pretty tight. I'm very nervous. He says, we got this. He says, the evangelicals are going door to door. They're getting that vote out. Conservative Catholics going door to door. The hobbits are going door to door in the Shire. And they're getting everybody out. Th that's why they fear you. They understand. Trust me. They know all the math. Right? They know all the math. They know what you did. They know what you did in Alabama. But on, on, on November 9th, I will tell you one thing because I was the CEO of it. You know, we were a little bit the island of misfit toys, right? <laughs> because it only come together in 88 days. But I will tell you, and I had a conversation with Jeff Sessions one time when he was under the most pressure over at DOJ. And I asked him flat out, I said, Senator Sessions, is there any doubt in your mind that the hand of providence was critical for our victory? He said, absolutely, divine providence Divine Providence worked in that victory, just like Divine Providence worked on Judge Moore. Now, the hand of Providence doesn't work as some sort of magic or voodoo. It's through human agency, and that's you. And we're going to have a lot of these conversations. We're going to have a lot of fights ahead, right? And the first one is, before we can get to the progressive Democrats and the Southern Poverty Law Center and all these folks we've got to take on, and we're going to take them on, and we're going to stand them down, okay? There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. But there's a time and season for everything. And right now, it's a season of war against a GOP establishment.
it's no longer acceptable to come and pat you on the head and tell you everything's going to be fine. Just get these guys in office. Those days are over. We need to move with urgency. The President of the United States deserves respect and deserves their support. Of all the insults that Senator Corker threw at the Commander-in-Chief in a time of war, the worst thing was, you know, it was Phil Rucker, I think, at the Washington Post, and I think it was Jonathan Martin, Peter Baker over the New York Times. They had the buried lead. Buried lead is about 20 paragraphs down. What Corker said, he gave up the game. He said, hey, there's only one or two senators up here that have any respect or admiration for President Trump. The rest of them all talk like I do, behind closed doors. So all of you folks that are so concerned that you're going to get primaried and defeated, you know, there's time for mea culpa. You can come to a stick and condemn Senator Corker. And you can come to a stick, a microphone, and you can say, I am not going to vote for Mitch McConnell for majority leader. And you can come to a stick and you can say, I'm going to do away with the filibuster so the president can implement his program. Now, Senator Barrasso and Senator Fisher and Senator Heller and the other one of you folks, Senator Hatch, if you do that, these are good folks. They may reconsider. But until that time, they're coming for you. I've gone over my lot of time, so I'm going to wrap up here in a second. You sound like my colleagues in the White House. Not. I'm going to come out and give you a hug. It's the last thing. The president needs our support more than ever. Look what happened, and here's what happens when the president knows he, he has your support. Because, you know, let's have a part in this discussion. The president had some bad information given to him and some bad advice given to him and, and uh, you know, had some folks telling him things that just weren't so. You know, and I, I'd kind of told him what was going to happen down in Alabama, where I was going to stand with the men and women that got him into office. But let's look at what's happened since Alabama. A 70-point program for DACA, including 20 deal killers. And, and, and just to make sure that uh, Durbin and Nancy Pelosi got the joke, so many White House officials said, oh, by the way, no pathway to citizenship. Right? That was the first thing, DACA. The next thing, you had the Religious Liberty EO that was gutted back in, in, in what, May? Surprise, surprise, surprise. A 25-page memo from Attorney General Sessions. The whole, you know... Uh, Little Sisters, the Poor Thing, everything turned around, number two, right? Got out of UNESCO, number three. Yep, yep. Got uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said, it's going to be a middle-class tax cut, and it's going to have the small business tax cut. This is going to be middle-class and for working-class people, I guarantee you. Then you had Obamacare, not going to make the CSR payments, going to blow that thing up, going to blow those exchanges up, right? And lo and behold, we're going to decertify and get out of the RAND deal and name the IGRC a terrorist organization. Those are not random events, folks. That is victory begets victory. We owe that to Judge Moore and the good men and women in Alabama because that all came from them. Every day is like Christmas Day now. I can't wait to get up. It's going to be a new package. This is the Trump program. This is what we always wanted. Heck, next week, 
They're going to, I hope, I think they're going to announce the Muslim Brotherhood of Terrorist Organization and move our embassy to Jerusalem. Oh, that's right. Mitch McConnell now is working triple time on getting those judges approved, right? <laughs> Funny how that all works. Victory begets victory. It's very simple. We keep winning, and good things are going to happen. We keep winning, and your country's going to be saved. We keep winning, and you folks, you, are going to be the folks who saved the Judeo-Christian West. Now, we don't have anything to offer you except a lot of work. And we're going to lose, by the way, they're going to be gray skies, and we're going to lose. We're going to lose some. It's not going to be all victories. We're going to have good days, and we're going to have bad days. And this is going to take a long time. And it's not any one election. It's not a November 9th or September 26, 2017 it's going to have to be every day. It's going to have to be every day. But if you folks don't do it, and the, peoples that, the people that you are proxies for, your organizations, it's not going to happen. We're going to lose this. But I can guarantee you one thing. There are good men and women out, out there that saw the lesson of Judge Moore and Donald Trump because the lesson that the media, the opposition party, and the money on Wall Street in the permanent political class tried to do was to say, if you stand up, you'll be destroyed. If you go against what they stand for, you will be destroyed. But folks out there know, if you have their back, you are the key that picks the lock. There's a um, Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, that says, I think, 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, that uh, the leader's best, that when the main objectives are achieved, the people themselves say, look what we accomplished. That means it's all on you. It's not Donald Trump. It's not Mark Meadows. It's not Ted Cruz. It's not Laura Ingram. It's not Steve Bannon. It's you. So tonight, when you pray for your country and the servicemen and President Trump and his family, say a prayer for yourselves. Because a hundred years from now, they're going to look back and they're going to hold you accountable for what you did in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if we stick together and show the same tenacity, the same grit, the same courage as you showed in Alabama, we're going to win and they're going to lose. Thank you. Well, our next speaker is one of those rare individuals. Honestly, if he was just reading the phone book, it would sound important. <laughs> Dr. Sebastian Gorka is an American military and intelligence analyst and former deputy assistant to President Donald Trump. His interviews with the liberal media are priceless to watch as he uses reason and logic to expose their ignorance and their bias. Today, he serves as chief strategist of the Make America Great Again Coalition. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Sebastian Gorka. What doesn't kill you makes you Thank you, thank you kindly. What an honor it is to be here today uh, again for my second uh, ever visit to the Valley Voters Summit. Um, what a, where do I begin? <laughs> first things first, would you all just please relax? Count to ten, 
and take a deep breath. I know a lot of you were very, very worried when somebody I worked for called Steve left the White House. And I know that even more of you, a week later, when I resigned, were very troubled. But there's no need. There's absolutely no need. The success of the values you believe in, the success of the mission that we all took upon ourselves last November the 8th, is not a function of where I sit or where Steve has his office. This is much larger than the White House. This is a national movement to retake our country. I know the left, I know the progressives were celebrating opening their bottles of champagne when Steve left and when I left, but they have no idea what they did. It's like that penultimate scene in Star Wars. I'm a, I'm a kid of the 70s, so I like all that stuff. When Darth Vader and Ben Kenobi are dueling on the Death Star, you remember? And Obi-Wan, the Master Jedi, says, if you strike me down now, I will be more powerful than you can ever imagine. <laughs> that is Steve Bannon today. <laughs> the left has no idea how much more damage we can do to them as private citizens, as people unfettered by being part of the U.S. government. And as you can see from the campaigning I did for Judge Moore and Steve as well, we have begun. 2018, 2018 will be the crucial year. This is the year. Steve has declared war on the rhino class, as have I, and we must tell them we have had enough. The left has a problem. The left is a problem. <laughs> but they have an excuse. They've been reading Saul Alinsky for 30 years. They've been listening to Noam Chomsky and moronic individuals like Michael Moore. But the Republican GOP establishment has no excuse. They say they are on the side of immutable, objective truth. They say that they believe in the founding principles of this, the greatest nation on God's earth. But they get to this city, and it all disappears. And they all become business as usual politicians. Could you imagine if any of our founding fathers had been told that there would be Americans who would be elected to be representatives of their state, who would then stay in office in D.C. for 30-plus years? They wouldn't have bothered to fight the British. And you'd all talk like me today. It is disgraceful. And that's what we're going to change this year. We're going to take on every swamp dweller. Every swamp dweller. Whether on the left or the right, they will be shown the door. And representative government will return. So that's the task we have ahead of us. Uh, before uh, we talk about how that will be done, and I know Steve has lots of things he's going to share with you about his plan, uh, let me share with you a little bit about my time inside the White House. It was a high honor, it was a career pinnacle to be asked to be a strategist and deputy assistant to this president. And I'd like to share with you a little, a little bit about who this man is, so that we can destroy 
all the lies, all the smears from the fake news industrial complex. The, f <laughs> the, first, the first thing, first thing, I met Donald J. Trump in the summer of 2015 when I was invited to his uh, office in New York to help prepare him for a, a debate, a presidential candidate's debate. And the thing that struck me uh, is that when the door closed, it was just him, myself, and Corey Lewandowski, his campaign manager, is that this man is exactly the same behind closed doors as he is in public. There's no filter. There's no false DC screen. There's no two faces. In D.C., you see these politicians that walk into a room and if they see somebody important or they see a TV camera, it's like a, a switch gets flicked at the back of their head and this grimace, this <laughs> Washington smile comes across them. There's nothing. There's, there's nothing like that. This man is who he is, unfiltered. What you see is what you get. And that's why Austin was so absolutely right in the previous panel. He doesn't care what the New York Times thinks about him. He doesn't care what CNN thinks about him. And rightly so, because those people don't represent America. They just don't represent America. So he is who he is. And the thing that made me realize that this is somebody that we can put our, our money on, we can bet that this guy can win, is that the first thing that was clear to me is that Donald J. Trump is kryptonite to political correctness. <laughs> he hates it with a passion. And it is only somebody of his ilk who could have won the election. Only somebody who couldn't care less about political correctness and was going to call out the fake news for their lies. So, number one, uh, he is who he is. Secondly, and the reason I really agreed to work for him, is within minutes it was clear to me that this man understands we are at war. He understands the threat from groups like ISIS. He understands the threats from countries like Iran, from China, from Russia. And the most important thing of all, he wants to win the war with our enemies. So that's the president. What happened in the last nine months? Why have you seen the things occur that have occurred? And here I'm going to use an analogy from my childhood. Uh, John Milius, great film director, great writer, a Hollywood legend. Uh, I'm sure most of you in here are familiar with one of his best movies, Red Dawn. And I mean the original Red Dawn. Red Dawn is a story set in the 80s about the Soviet Union and uh, Cuba invading the United States. And a scrappy little band of insurgents stands up to fight this giant juggernaut of communism. That's really what happened on November the 8th. On November the 8th, a man who was the rank outsider, think about it, never held public office in his life, a rank outsider wiped the floor with 16 rhino establishment candidates. Not only did he defeat his establishment rivals, he then proceeded on the night of November the 8th to defeat a woman who had officially, but you can double it, officially spent $700 million on a campaign for a seat that she thought was rightfully hers because of her gender and her last name. And he defeated her. As a result, when we moved into the White House a few months later, on January the 20th, it was a scrappy band of insurgents that moved into the White House. It wasn't the schlep of a GOP establishment of a rhino candidate. It was the utter outsider and his small band of merry men and women. <laughs> no, it was. It was like Robin Hood. Robin Hood taking over the empire. And a couple of dozen people gained the reins of an administration that has more than two million employees in it. If you add the armed forces, it's several million people work for the federal government. In fact, the best description for what happened at 12.01 on January the 20th is the most leveraged hostile takeover in U.S. history. <laughs> uh, 
as a result, as a result, it is not surprising, and nobody should be surprised, that over the next few months, the, the massive establishment swamp treated us as antibodies <laughs> and did everything they could to box us out, to fire more lower-level individuals who are Trump loyalists in the National Security Council. And then eventually we realized the writing was on the wall. Steve and myself realized if we believe in November the 8th, if we really want to support the president, the best way we can do that is from the outside of the building. So bottom line, relax, take a deep breath, count to 10, it's going to be okay. Because this is not about the last eight months, it's about the next eight years. And then, then, it's about the following eight years under President Pence. The fact is, the president is surrounded by people who have nothing to do with his original campaign. He has people in high office in his administration who not only would have been comfortable in a Clinton administration, they would have been cabinet members in a Clinton administration. But it's okay. Why? Does anybody in this room think that the only people a president talks to are people who have a government ID badge? I can tell you, he doesn't just talk to those people. And the president is very loyal to those who are loyal to him. And he is, you must understand, if you only want to know one thing about this president, he is a pragmatist. Look at what he's done. Steve's going to talk about the amazing things he's done in the last eight months. But not only is he a pragmatist with the eye of a businessman, he is a patriot and he loves this country. Yeah. Additionally, and I, I'd like to ask for your assistance here. I tell you, hand on heart, and if there was a good book here, I'd swear on the Bible, there is not a racist bone, nay, there is not a racist molecule in that man's body. The, the accusations against myself and Steve, you know, we take that as, you know, if you're not taking flack, you're not over the target, right? If, if the Washington Post or the New York Times or Politico or CNN ever said anything nice about me, you should all ask for your money back, okay? <laughs> but when the President of the United States is labeled a racist, a xenophobe, an anti-Semite, when his grandchildren are Orthodox Jews, then it's an outrage. It's an outrage, and I'd like to call upon you as force multipliers to push back on the lies. Don't let them get away with it. And we are winning already. Look at the facts. Anderson Cooper, the, the star of CNN, on a good night gets 700,000 viewers, okay? 700,000 viewers. This is a nation of 330 million Americans. Okay, they're irrelevant. They are ranked 13th nationally in viewership, two positions between Nick at Night and their cartoon shows. Okay, that's what the American people think of CNN. On the other hand, people like Sean Hannity, they're crushing it every night, crushing it every night, breaking records, millions of people watching them. So push back on the lies. Don't let them get away with it. So, what about the road ahead? What do we have to do? We have to support the president. It's not about one man, please. This is not a cult of personality. It's about what we voted for on November the 8th. And, and it's very important to understand the philosophical underpinnings. This isn't just random stuff we kluge together during the campaign. There's one thing that underpins every single thing that was part of our campaign, whether it's the war, whether it's defeating ISIS, whether it's pulling out of NAFTA, whether it's leaving UNESCO. All of these things together are tied with one philosophical connective tissue, national sovereignty. We want our sovereignty back. If 1776 means anything today, 
It is that the word America has meaning. And it's not some crypto fascist garbage that they accuse us of. Because and for 50 bucks, you get a, you get a, um, we got a, we love you, Hillary, still t shirt. Um, For $100, you get a subscription, lifetime subscription to Mother Jones. I think that's going out of business, but you still get the subscription. And this is what I find most interesting that the DNC is doing. They, they, they need more bundlers. You know, if you, if you raise $100,000, $150,000, you're called a bundler. So if you sign up to be a bundler and you're really aggressive about it, I guess now the DNC has announced, this was yesterday, uh, they will send you a terry cloth robe that opens easily in the front. It's odd, though, all that robes have HW as the initials, the monogram. I think we have to laugh, don't you? You know, they always say we're judged by the company we keep, and that's a, that's a pretty good line. It's, pretty, it's a pretty good rule of thumb. But I also think we should judge ourselves on the enemies we make. Think about the Republicans who supported Donald Trump and continued to support his populist agenda, the agenda that I outline in Billionaire at the Barricades, uh, my new book. Uh, it's a nationalist agenda. You heard Steve talk about it. It's, it's America first. It's policies that work for the people. But think about it. If you're for Donald Trump and you're for that agenda, not the old Republican agenda, but that agenda, your enemies are the following. Or they've declared war on you. Antifa, you know, the, the, the fascist group. They call it anti-fascist, but it is most fascist. La Raza, uh, the NFL anthem squatters. They don't much like you. Since when did kneeling become... I don't even understand the protest. Why is kneeling even a bad thing? If they're kneeling at the anthem, you could say that maybe they actually just like the anthem a lot. Like when you kneel, it's a sign of respect. I don't even understand their protest. Most of the press corps, they're, of course, an against us. Most of the entertainment industry, because we know they are the moral arbiters of our time. Uh, the Democrat machine, still run by the previous administration. And of course, not, let's not forget the never-Trump globalist GOP and the consultancy and pundit class, uh, including, by the way, uh, on Capitol Hill, all those senators who, if their primaries were held today in their home state, uh, they would be sent packing. Uh, speaking of, uh, there, uh, before I lose, uh, you know, leave this topic, there is some good news out there. There is uh, great news, actually. This is New York Times. Uh, finally, speaking of the Weinstein mess in Hollywood, there's finally a new law firm that has formed to give Gloria Allred a run for her money. You know, she represents a lot of these women who have been abused and subjugated in the workplace. Uh, and it's just, just formed. It's going to be a big deal. It's called Clinton, Weiner, Spitzer, and Weinstein. <laughs> Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Let's not forget how conservative women have been dismissed and demeaned and reviled by uh, all the right people, all the right adversaries. Perhaps uh, Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama. Uh, who said, we voted for Trump because we do what we're told to do. Now, everyone who knows me uh, would know that that wouldn't really apply. Uh, but I think, even, what about all those workshops and all of those seminars that Hillary and Michelle uh, convened about girl power and, and, you know, girl first and, you know, we got to support women. It doesn't matter what your views are. You know, at the same time, I was thinking, maybe Hillary should rename her book tour. It should be called, I Am Woman, Hear Me Bore. <laughs> They're so exposed, right? They were, never for, they were never for women of different political viewpoints. They are for you, women, if you agree with them, liberals. If you are a woman who truly thinks for herself and is not cowed or, or frightened because of the calumny being directed your way, then, frankly, you don't really deserve protection. They don't really care about you, and they will ridicule you. 
and usually in front of a, in a university setting uh, or in some uh, general uh, session of left-wing malcontents. I titled my new book Billionaire at the Barricades for a reason. It, the subtitle is The Populist Revolution from Reagan to Trump. Donald Trump has a lot of walls to clear and one wall to build. He has the old GOP guard that never really wanted him to succeed. Of course, he has a, an entertainment industry uh, that really should be sending him residuals because apparently they can't write a joke that doesn't include his name. Uh, he's up against the Democrat machine, uh, of course, that is fueled by groups like the American Association of Trial Lawyers, uh, Planned Parenthood, and uh, every other left-wing interest group that you can think of. He's against the bipartisan cabal that has gotten fat and happy off the old way. They became very comfortable in a Washington that didn't represent the people. And the people are on to them. The American people, whether in this moment they like Donald Trump or not, the American people, I think, are, are really smart. That's the reason I describe myself as a conservative populist. I would rather, like Donald Trump, trust the people to run their lives rather than a far-flung bureaucracy at the World Trade Organization or the UN or some government agency that will never be accountable to you. I trust the American people. The government works for them, not the other way around. The government is not enslaving the people. The government are supposed to be the servants of the people, period. People ask me, like, well, you know, why, Laura, is this big rift in the Republican Party? And I explain all this from my days uh, as a young 22-year-old 20, working in the Reagan administration and how he inspired my generation and so many who came after, uh, all the way up until uh, we gave Eric Cantor uh, a, a two-by-four uh, across the electoral face with Dave Pratt in, tw in 2014. I explain, I explain how... This, he, Donald Trump, he didn't win because of, of, of Comey or even because Hillary was a bad candidate. He didn't win because he was a celebrity or even that he was self-funded. Donald Trump won because he was unafraid to hold up a mirror to the failures of the bipartisan establishment that refused to do what the people for really a couple of decades had been demanding that they do. That's why he won. He won because of the issues. Who voted for open borders? Who voted to deindustrialize the Midwest? Who voted to send millions of our jobs to Asia and other countries? Who voted for per perpetually low wages for our middle class and low entry, uh, entry level position workers? Who voted to completely upend the understanding of gender in the United States? Who voted for any of this? The answer is none of us voted for this. We voted for candidates along the way who promised to do our will and respect the Constitution. That is what we did because we tended to give people the benefit of the doubt. And like you know, Lucy in the football, uh, we kind of became Charlie Brown, election cycle after election cycle, until we couldn't take it anymore. Our back was about to break. We saw the country was about to be lost forever. Donald Trump understood that uniquely, and he, he, he followed in the line of others who came before, however, from going all the way back to Richard Nixon and believing that we, have to, uh, we had to listen to the silent majority, to law and order, to all the way up to Ronald Reagan surprising a GOP establishment in 1976 by almost winning the nomination, and then coming, coming along like a hurricane himself in 1980 and uh, blowing past the bushes and everyone else who ridiculed him, demeaned him, and said he was just an actor. He didn't know anything. He shook up the country. He brought us back from the brink. He helped defeat the Soviet Union. And he set a blueprint, a conservative, oftentimes populist blueprint for how to appeal to a wider range of Americans. 
I went back and in the book I, I describe what happened in 1988 as Reagan was leaving office. Just to, just to show you this divide wasn't created by Donald Trump. This divide has been there. 1988, as, uh, as Reagan was leaving office, uh, a lot of us uh, Reaganites were going on to do other things. I was going to law school uh, at the University of Virginia and some of my colleagues wanted to stay and help the Bush administration. Well, they didn't know that slowly but surely the Reagan people would be purged from the ranks of the new Bush administration. And why would they be purged? And I describe a particular incident at the Department of Justice, which is disturbing. Why were they purged? Because philosophically, Reagan was on a different plane than, uh, than George H.W. Bush. He respected him. He picked him as his vice president. But Reagan uniquely understood the heart and soul of the American working class. He understood that without social conservatives and defense hawks and libertarians and the populace all together, this coalition would crumble. And indeed, we saw it beginning to crumble in 1992. Who came along then, of course? Well, pitchfork Pat Buchanan. With many of the same issues we're talking today, warning that if we had open borders, and trade agreements that did not benefit the American working class, that the American, the American understanding would itself be endangered. As more people thought the system just didn't even work anymore, it didn't work for them, it didn't work for their, their kids, uh, that in fact they were being treated as the enemies of the government. And Pat Buchanan ultimately wasn't successful, but let's not forget whether it was him or Ross Perot, boy, did they, did they garner a lot of support? And did they set the stage for what would come all those years later with Donald Trump? Remember, even George W. Bush ran on a humble foreign policy in, in 2000. And that was welcome, uh, welcome news to uh, the voters at the time. In 1988, the Cato Institute wrote a long article ridiculing Ronald Reagan. Now, I like a lot of the folks at Cato. I like a lot of the stuff they do on taxes and the deregulatory stuff. But they branded Reagan and know-nothing protectionist on trade. Why? Ronald Reagan thought it was worthwhile to save an American company called Harley-Davidson. He believed that it was well within our right in protecting our people and our businesses to slap a 45% temporary tariff on cheap Japanese motorcycles that came into the United States. And lo and behold, we have one of the most successful American companies still in business today because of what Ronald Reagan did at that moment to save that American company. That was wildly popular. It was a populist Ronald Reagan. That was the protectionist Ronald Reagan. What, since when is it bad to be a protectionist, by the way? What, you are protecting something, right? You are conserving something. Republican presidents throughout our history understood that there will be certain times where temporary tariffs are necessary to level, level the playing field in the international marketplace. It just makes sense. When, we're, when our companies are getting hammered overseas with tariffs and, and barriers, we just let everyone come here with, with the nary a peep. And certainly uh, the, the mood and the establishment of the GOP was very anti-tariff. Uh, anti, anti Ronald Reagan said it doesn't have to be this way. Even George W. Bush slapped temporary tariffs on cheap, cold-rolled steel coming in from China. Today, all these years later, what is Donald Trump doing? Donald Trump has assembled without a doubt, the most impressive, the most qualified trade team that we've ever seen in American government. The most incredible people. They don't get much credit, by the way. And I'm not going to repeat all this stuff that Bannon said about, about uh, the issues that we all care about. On this issue, Bob Lighthizer was the deputy U.S. trade representative, I think the youngest in American history, for Ronald Reagan. He is now our U.S. trade representative. He is phenomenal. Phenomenal. I think for the first time I, I, in decades, we now have Lighthizer and Wilbur Ross at Commerce is helping. Stephen Vaughn is the is a general counsel over there. We have amazing people. Peter Navarro at the White House. They are doing something called, and I don't want to sound wonky here, but a 301 investigation on China. It's under the Federal Fair Trade Act in the 1970s.